As you begin your journey into organic chemistry, there are a few chemical concepts that reviewing can help set you on a path towards success. These all come from concepts that you would have learned in previous chemistry courses that you're going to need to bring with you into organic chemistry. What I'm going to do is place on the screen a series of questions all about a specific molecule. I'd like for you to pause the video when the question comes up and see if you can answer these questions independently. Then resume the video and I'll walk through how to answer all of those questions. And again, I promise all of this review is going to be really integral to your early success when we're learning organic chemistry. This is the chemical formula for formaldehyde, which is an embalming fluid. Its chemical formula is one carbon, two hydrogens, and a single oxygen. The first step to determining the Lewis structure is to first figure out how many valence electrons. And a quick review of electron configuration would be prudent here. So consider carbon, which is the sixth element on the periodic table. Its full electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Now, the valence electrons are going to be all the electrons in this outermost shell or valence shell of orbitals. And as we can see from the superscripts at following each of the atomic orbitals, there are two electrons in the s orbitals and two electrons in the p orbitals. This means that carbon has four valence electrons. Another way that you can quickly determine how many valence electrons there are for each individual atom is to go to the row on the periodic table where you find each atom. So for carbon, it's the second row. Start on the left-hand side of the periodic table and count over until you get to carbon. If you did that, you would see that carbon is the fourth element on the second row of the periodic table. So carbon has four valence electrons. Hydrogen is the first atom on the periodic table, and its electron configuration is 1s1. So each hydrogen has one valence electron. Now if you look for oxygen, you see that it's the eighth element on the periodic table, or the sixth element on the second row of the periodic table. This means that oxygen has six valence electrons. Now, now that we know individually for each atom how many valence electrons there are, we can figure out how many valence electrons we have for this entire molecule. So since we have one carbon, that's four valence electrons, we have two hydrogens, that's going to be two times one for a total of two, and then we have a single oxygen, which is going to give us six valence electrons, and if we take the sum, four plus two is six, plus six is twelve, we see that we have 12 valence electrons with which to create our Lewis structure. The next step to creating Lewis structures is to place the least electronegative atom in the center of the molecule. Keep in mind, though, that you never place hydrogen at the center of a molecule. So, therefore, if you remember the periodic trends for electronegativity, you increase electronegativity as you go up and to the right on the periodic table. This is why fluorine is the most electronegative atom, followed by oxygen. Okay, so then that means that carbon is our least electronegative atom. So we can place it in the center. There, from there, you draw your skeletal structure with a single bond to each of the other outer atoms. And at this point, remember that each bond indicates that two electrons have been used. So we have used two, four, six electrons of our 12, meaning that we have six more with which to populate this Lewis structure. The next step is to adorn the outer atoms with lone pairs until you satisfy the octet rule, or surround each atom by eight electrons. Keep in mind, though, that because hydrogen is in the n equals one uh, principal quantum number atomic orbital subshell, it only needs two electrons to fill, which means that hydrogen is one of the uh, examples that are exempt from the octet rule. It only needs two electrons around it to be uh, to have a full noble gas configuration. So that means that each of these hydrogens are completely filled with their valence shell, which means I will place my next six electrons around oxygen. Now oxygen has two, four, six, eight electrons around it. Remember the hydrogens only need two, so those are satisfied. But carbon only has two, four, six electrons around it. So even though we've used all 12, carbon has not satisfied the octet rule. So therefore, what we'll do is we'll take two of these electrons and move them down 
to create a double bond on the oxygen to carbon. This means that our final Lewis structure is going to be this. Now that we have determined the correct Lewis structure for formaldehyde, or CH2O, we can do a few different things. Number one, we can determine the hybridization around each atom. So let's say we wanted to do carbon. Remember that the full electron configuration for carbon arises from the electron energy diagram where carbon has six total electrons. And when it goes to form these bonds, it does so through what's called hybridization, where it mixes some of the S, P, or potentially even D orbitals to create these uh, molecular bonds. So, remember we do not need to concern ourselves with the inner or core electrons. We're only interested in this valence shell of electrons, so the 2s and the 2p orbitals for carbon. Because it is making three different sigma bonds, it is going to combine three of these orbitals. The first one is going to be the s orbital, always, and then the next two will come from the p orbitals. This generates three brand new hybridized orbitals, and because there are three of them, one is the s, so it would be 1s, and two of them were p orbitals. This gives rise to the hybridization, which we call sp2 hybridization. Notice that this left one unhybridized p orbital, which would just come over in energy over here. This leaves behind an unhybridized p orbital. And that's actually what orbital is involved in the pi bond that's formed between carbon and oxygen. So carbon, then, is sp2 hybridized. Now, another concept that you would have learned previously came from Vesper theory, where you determine the electron or molecular geometry of molecules to figure out their three-dimensional shape. Okay, so one of the things that you should know is that sp2 hybridized molecules always form trigonal planar molecular geometry. That's trigonal planar, which means that this is a planar molecule, meaning that it's flat in the shape of the board that's in front of you, but also I could turn it flat and it would be, you know, sticking out at you, for example. That's a planar molecule, anything that lies on a plane. So from here, we can also then determine the bond angle around each of these bonds. Trigonal planar always forms bonds around the center atom that is 120 degrees, which means that the angle between these two bonds is 120 degrees, and similarly, the angle between these two bonds is also 120 degrees. One of the things that we can do now that we have our Lewis structure is determine the formal charge around each atom. You should remember that the formal charge, or Fc, is equal to the number of valence electrons for any particular atom, minus the number of lone pair electrons, minus the number of bonds around that atom. And we can do that for each of these atoms individually. Starting with hydrogen, the formal charge for hydrogen, the number of valence electrons for hydrogen is 1. There are no lone pairs around hydrogen in this structure, and there is one bond between carbon and hydrogen. This means 1 minus 1 is equal to 0, so hydrogen has a 0 formal charge. Similarly, carbon has 4 valence electrons. It is surrounded by no lone pairs of electrons, and it is surrounded by 1, 2, 3, 4 bonds. This means that ox carbon is also a formal charge of 0. Oxygen has six valence electrons. It is surrounded by two plus two is four lone pair electrons. And it is surrounded by one, two bonds. Therefore, oxygen is also a zero. An example of a molecule where you're going to have atoms that don't have a formal charge of zero looks something like this which is formate. So similarly, hydrogen would have the same uh, zero formal charge, carbon would have zero, and this oxygen, sorry, I put in too many electrons, 
this oxygen would also have a zero formal charge. However, notice that this oxygen looks a little bit different. So if we were to determine the formal charge of this oxygen, we would say that there are six valence electrons for this oxygen. O oxygen always has six valence electrons. There are two, four, six lone pair electrons around that oxygen, and there is one chemical bond which would give this oxygen a one minus formal charge, which often we will place next to the atom and circle it like that to indicate that there is a formal charge of one minus around this oxygen. When determining the bond distance or the bond energy between two atoms, there are a few important things to consider. The first is going to be the bond order. Bond order, which is basically just another way of saying how many bonds are between two atoms. So, for example, a CC single bond has a bond order of 1, and a CC double bond has a bond order of 2. I think that that's pretty intuitive. And importantly, bond order can help you determine which is going to produce a shorter distance between the two nuclei of two uh, atoms that are connected to one another via these covalent bonds. So, a bond order of 2 is going to be shorter than in bond order of 1, meaning that the CC double bond is shorter than a CC single bond. Similarly, we can also determine things like bond dissociation energy, which is the amount of energy required to break apart two different atoms. And similar to how bond order produced a shorter bond by increasing the number of bonds between two atoms, this is also going to increase the energy associated with breaking them apart. This means then that a bond order of two is going to be shorter, stronger, and require more energy to break them apart. So then looking back at formaldehyde, it should be clear to see that because the CO is a double bond versus the CH being a single bond, that this bond between carbon and oxygen is going to be shorter. This also means that it's going to take more energy to break those two atoms apart. Now, another thing to consider when evaluating bond distance and bond dissociation energy and strength of bonds is going to be which atoms are involved in the bonding. So consider an example where you have HF versus HCl versus HBr. So you should notice that fluorine, chlorine, and bromine are all halogens, or group 17 on the periodic table. Because fluorine is smaller, than chlorine and bromine, this HF bond is actually going to be shorter and stronger than the HCl and the HBr bond, which means that as you go down the periodic table, you typically end up with bond distances that are greater. And this also means that a greater bond distance would meet a weaker bond. Remember that a covalent bond is the sharing of electrons between two different atoms. Also recall that there are electronegativity differences in between atoms. So here's my crude drawing of a periodic table. And you'll recall that as you go up and to the right of the periodic table, you get more and more electronegative atoms, which means that fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen are going to be some of the most electronegative atoms on the periodic table, where it's where, uh, compared to something that's like down here, like francium, for example, which is not going to be very electronegative. Okay, so when we have two atoms that are sharing electrons, oftentimes you can end up with a polarity difference between them, meaning that one of the atoms is dominating the electron sharing or pulling the electrons closer to them. So you can think of an example like HF, which is a polar covalent bond because fluorine is significantly more electronegative than hydrogen. And what this means is that the electrons are actually closer to the fluorine atom. And we indicate this by drawing a dipole, which is a vector, showing that the electrons are actually closer towards fluorine. And if we were to look at the electron cloud density of this atom, what we would normally see if we had two atoms of the same type, like HH, is that their electron cloud would basically show an even distribution of electrons between those two atoms. However, if you looked at something like HF, you would see that there's much more electron density around the fluorine than there is between the hydrogen. And this is, again, because the fluorine is more electronegative, and it's pulling the electrons closer to fluorine. 
Now, when looking at these, carbon and hydrogen have very similar electronegativity values. But carbon and oxygen do have a disparate value as it relates to their electronegativity. Oxygen, in fact, is the second most electronegative atom on the periodic table, at least according to the Pauling scale. So therefore, we would expect that this would be a polar covalent bond where the electrons are being pulled towards oxygen. And the carbon and hydrogen bond is actually nonpolar. It's effectively nonpolar because the electronegativity values between carbon and hydrogen are much more similar to, to one another. Now, now that we know that there is a polar covalent bond, that doesn't actually mean always that you're going to have a polar molecule. Consider, for example, BF3, which looks like this, which is also trigonal planar. Okay, so we have a trigonal planar molecule with polar covalent bonds between the boron to fluorine, just like we have a trigonal planar molecule with a uh, polar covalent bond pulled towards oxygen. Now, remember, you probably have seen this example before of carbon dioxide, where you do have a polar covalent bond with electrons being pulled towards the oxygen. But also on the other side, in fact, the direct opposite direction, you have another dipole pulling towards the oxygen. And overall, because of the three-dimensional shape of this linear carbon dioxide, or CO2, those dipoles are pulling in equal but opposite directions, which cancels out the overall polarity of the molecule, and CO2 is in fact a nonpolar molecule. So, if we looked at BF3, we would see that we have these three dipoles. There are polar covalent bonds between boron and fluorine, but because they're pulling in opposite directions, they end up canceling out, and BF3 is also a nonpolar molecule. But notice, for formaldehyde, or CH2O, we don't have any other dipoles pulling in opposite directions from this initial polar covalent bond, which means that this is, in fact, a polar molecule. So when we think about things like the intermolecular forces, this BF3 and CO2 should only show London dispersion forces, whereas formaldehyde not only has London dispersion forces like every molecule does, but it also would display dipole-dipole interactions, where you have a partially negative end of the molecule indicated by this delta negative symbol, and you have partially positive end of the molecule where there's less electron density.